Hi guys, uh, welcome back. It is the 17th of July. It is day 119 of lockdown and we are here again and it's daytime again. Like we're being very good, like more than one daytime vlog in a week. That's unheard of. Uh, but it's only because I'm going out drinking again, basically. Uh, yeah, uh, but I'm not venturing far tonight. After we finish vlogging, I am walking all the great distance to the other side of the street. Uh, to have some drinks in Harriet's garden. Yes. Um, so you're looking forward to uh, a night uh, away from the old ball and chain, I gather. Made yeah. made some plans. Oh, I'm gonna watch some sports. Some things I don't let him do when I'm here. Eat some fish and chips. <laughs> yep. Well, yeah, that's the kind of the archetype, isn't it? Like the the wife goes away. And, oh, she's away. Um, I can. I can I, eat what I want and I can watch my sports. I was joking about this because sit went, around in my went, pants. When we went out the other night, my friend rang up and uh, and, he, and I was like, "Oh yeah, early out. What, what are you doing?" Well, I've just finished watching a video about a uh, character nuance in the narrative in the story arc of uh, the character Michael Scott in the sitcom The Office. It's actually uh, it's actually quite sweet. Mm. You know? So that's the sort of thing I get up to when you're not around. I'd be more than happy to watch that while, while I was here. That's that, that's fine. That sounds quite nice. Uh, yeah, no, it was um, lovely. Yeah, I don't really think we've got the dynamic of like, oh, great, they're away. Now I can do all that stuff that they don't let me do. I, like, I guess there might be like stuff that I like want to watch that you're not interested in, but then like I'll watch it and you'll like read while we've I'm watching got, it or yeah, whatever or if we, if vice we have versa. To, we've got other rooms, haven't we? We don't, yeah. you know. Yeah, but that's that it is quite a common little sort of trope, and I just wonder how true it is of most relationships because mm. it's like that's a bit sad if there's like li big huge amounts of things that you can only do when the other one's out or away. Which like maybe that's why some people's lockdowns been harder than others. Yes, you have got my shiny lips, lips look quite shiny because I've been kissing someone with lip gloss. Who's that then? Oh, I don't let's talk about it. <laughs> Was it Tom? It was not time, <laughs> uh, because we maintained social distance. Uh, I had a kissing. friend come yes. around uh, to visit, and we went. We walked the dog together in the woods, and we had a uh, drink in the front garden, yep. which I wouldn't no normally. I feel like that isn't something I would do as a general rule. Does have rule, little like dashes of chaviness about it, doesn't it? Drinking in the front garden. Connotations to go yeah. drinking in your front garden, um, but. I feel like um, street party rules. Yeah. You know, when it comes to lockdown, you can drink in your front gardens now, and it's fine. So um, the side gate was locked, and it was easier than sort of faffing. I suppose. Me sort of wandering through the house, unlocking the gate, letting someone through. I would just come back from walking the dog. I was a bit hot, and I just wanted to start drinking cider. But you do look all sparkly lipped now. In, instead, I was wondering, I, I, like, whenever the weather it's starting to cool down now, but it's quite a hot afternoon. Whenever the weather is like nice and hot like that. I always want to drink cider in the sun. Like mm. that is always my uh, instinct. Like normally, if I can't hide from the sun, the one thing that I think is good about the sun is I can drink a, a nice, nice refreshing cider, cider yeah. in it, and the sun and and the heat and the coolness of the cider complement each other. Yeah, right. that's what I, I always want that. to do. But then, then so it's the middle say, of the day and you've been drinking cider. Yeah, nine times out of ten, I end up like feeling a little bit like. You know, because something about drinking it in the sun seems to make it hit you harder. Well, I think it probably actually does, because you're probably a bit more dehydrated than you would be because you've been hot and sweaty. So actually, maybe the alcohol hits and a bit then quicker. I would end up feeling just slightly fuzzy. Do you know what I mean? It's not. I don't feel sick. I don't feel, but just slightly like oof, and a little bit oh. And so I've had some uh, Pepsi now to get a bit of caffeine right. and things to balance it out. Yeah, I'm, but, uh, I'm making sure I've, I'm suitably hydrated with my tea before I go over there and drink all the wine, because it will be all the wine. But I was wondering about that, that though. You know how people ascribe certain characteristics to certain alcohols? Yes. Yeah. And like, so people say gin makes you weepy or whatever yeah. it might be. And certainly in my own experience, I feel like if I have cider, I get a little bit hazy and maybe a little bit sloppy. Um, if I have red wine, I feel like I'm becoming incredibly like loquacious and uh, relaxed and kind of happy. And, you're and very chatty and sort of put the worlds to rights a bit when you're on red wine, which is and good. I, I feel like that, that riffs off my energy well, quite I, well. I feel like <laughs> I'm more articulate, but I don't know if that's just how I feel. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, I, d I, I don't like, like, like I, I doubt like anybody's actually more articulate no, when they've I, had food, but, but I, I guess maybe like you feel comfortable to be sort of. I feel Having like I can, more... you know, kind of. I guess it's like when people uh, Ooh. have. Oh, uh, hopefully, a pop yeah, up. a big pop up, but it's fine. It's it's fine. It's still recording. It so. a, because it had an alien face on it as well. <laughs> it was a bit like we've got kind of like an alienware PC, isn't it? Yeah. But 
an alien face. A big alien face came up on our screen in between and us. My like, first thought is kind of like virus or hacker coming. or something. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway. Sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> like, I feel like when I'm on, like when people take cocaine, they get really confident and kind of just yeah. think they're having all these brilliant ideas and it's nonsense. And with red wine, I don't think I'm necessarily having loads of brilliant ideas, but I do think I might. I feel how it feels for the time is that it it sharpens my ability to convey my ideas. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like I a, think that's. Um, I is, definitely have um, <clears throat> affinities for certain drinks, but it's mine far and away. You will have noticed is red wine, and I think it is partly for sort of how you feel when you drink it. And I do feel with red wine that it helps me be more conversational and um, chattier and express myself. I'm probably not expressing myself as well as I could, but I feel like I am. Um, And I don't like, there's some tropes that I think, like, it's probably bullshit and it's probably just due to other sort of factors that are involved with the kinds of drinking. Because they refer to, like, Stella, for example, as being, like, um, a lager that makes blokes, like, violent and aggressive. But what that probably boils down to is it's just a little bit stronger than other like ciders, you uh, uh, other lagers that you'd be drinking when out. So if you've had a night on the Stella, you might have drunk the same number of pints, but you've had more is alcohol. Is it stronger though? Is that the thing? I think that's what it was. It might oh, not be any more. Well, people, I remember someone saying something about like they use different. Oh, there's all sorts of nasty stuff in it as well. It. Yeah, but I don't know. There's, um, I think there's a, a slight uh-huh. truism about whiskey. Um, and Dylan Morin does a really good um, sort of whole piece on the different kinds of drunk you are on different alcohols. And actually, I think he's kind of on point with, with all of them. Um, like, vodka is very deceptive and you're sort of drinking it. And you're like, well, what is this? This isn't anything. And then suddenly you realise, why am I on an island? Kind of thing. It's like, oh, well, well, when did this happen? Um, wine, very chatty, you make plans. You sort of feel very sort of eloquent and thoughtful. Gin is mascara thinner. Uh, but whiskey turns you into two people and it'll turn you into, like, the most welcoming and kind and friendly person to strangers and the most vile, horrible person to people you know and love. Mm. So it's like, I can't like I can't really vouch. I've only ever had like one or two sort of partners that have really been into whiskey, but I have always known like, oh God, he's been on the whiskey. Oh, we're gonna have arguments. <laughs> that's what that's gonna be. Because some people uh, say, <laughs> some people say it's a myth, don't they? That kind of, it's oh, all alcohol is the same, and it's just kind of. But I, I do think like I'm affected differently by different ways. I feel like there's some truth in it, but it might not be down to the alcohol. It might be down to the kinds of nights you're having if you're drinking those drinks kind of thing. Because I'll use the example of tequila. Tequila is a fun, silly drink for me. Uh, but if I'm at the stage where I'm ordering tequila, that's probably that I'm already quite silly. And then I equate the sort of silly, like, te- oh, agua bombs, man. They are the devil, but I love them. Agua bomb, agua, if you don't know, it's uh, like a spirit um, that is uh, basically made from the coca leaf. Um, so it's perfectly legal, uh, but it, I guess, has the connotations of it'll give you a bit of a, a bit of a sort of cokey kind of lift. It obviously it doesn't, but it's booze and it's strong. But agua bombs are then mixed with Red Bull. Um, and you sort of drink them in a special shot glass, which means you get it into two layers. They do them in La Pub, and whenever I've had a night where I've ended up on the Agua Bombs, it's been a good night, but Christ, I've not made good choices. Uh, but it's it's a silly, so tequila, agua, those sorts of nights, I feel like I'm silly happy. To, to, they're always nights when I break my no dancing rule. I have a, 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 a no dancing rule because I love dancing, and I always used to, act like a night out dancing and like yeah you stop for having a drink here and there but essentially the main activity is the dancing oh my god i used to love them but obviously i can't do that uh post fibro because the exercise is just too much and the lesson i have learned is it is never worth it never worth it fun at the time agony then for the next few days can't move can't walk on top of already having probably a fucking hideous hangover well, we're, um, at some point we're gonna have to do it a first dance aren't we Al? yeah like, I, I i will allow that for like but uh, like, i, I like mean like not like a one. dancing night I, out where i'm gonna get properly like well, what I'm hot thinking, and sweaty but what i'm thinking is about that yeah like that's the conventional thing that you do at a wedding like and this is only i'm just thinking out loud here this isn't something i've considered before but like the conventional thing is you have a wedding, 
and then you have like a disco or yeah. like a band and everyone dances. Yeah, I can't really do that. But if it's like supposed to be the happiest day of our lives, like we're supposed to be the ones it's about, can we just switch that up and go, we'll all see a film instead? <laughs> And that's not very sociable, is it? And, and but now like... let's welcome the the happy couple into the auditorium to take the first bite of popcorn. Like, I... <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I don't mind. Other, I, like, I think it will probably be quite a fun atmosphere to have music and have other people dancing. But it's just, I will be very clear, probably quite early on. I'm not going to be dancing all night because. Put it in the invitations. Yeah. Get the information out there. Just it's Get not going to happen, guys. Well, do you know what? That I say that it's never worth it. On my wedding day, maybe that's just worth being in pain for a few days afterwards and actually just letting loose and having a really nice fun time. But mm. it's just generally speaking, if you've got to go back to normality after it, it's just the pain's not worth it. It's just painful because I'll be able to, like, particularly my lower body and my legs, uh, because obviously I, think, I guess sort of you're dancing all from your hips and downwards and it's just they seize up and it's so painful. So then, like, for days afterwards, like, I'm having to like sort of go up and down stairs on my knees mm. like and it's just this miserable um which is a shame because i did used to bloody love a silly dance night out and the only times i ever break that rule agua or tequila are involved um but like you know i guess i'm having a good time but it's probably just that i'm extra drunk and i'm being sociable so i feel like it's the tequila but maybe it's not um and maybe again with the whiskey it's just well maybe that's been like you've been drinking sort of normally but then you've had extra drinks and maybe it's just that they're more drunk and you know drunk people can sometimes lean towards being well it's usually men uh lean towards being a bit aggressive if they've had too much to drink which like i think i just oh god this last week though like i haven't actually had like very drunken nights all week but i had the one on saturday no wednesday when i was over mappies that's Sarah, by the way. Um, and, yeah, tearful. I was a tearful drunk on Wednesday, which that's not my usual state of affairs at all. I'm usually a pretty happy drunk. Um, so I don't know if that's just a little bit of just mental health nonsense creeping out. But, um, yeah, I don't like that. Like, there are, some, there are some people, and this is usually women, that you just sort of think, you always end up crying, so why do you drink? You're not having a good time. But I don't usually, but I was. I kept crying over really fairly stupid things, actually. Um, so, yeah, you know, just sometimes it's a different kind of drunk. And I ate loads of crisps, which I later found out had milk in them, so I broke my veganism as well, which really sort of... Oh, no. I was annoyed with myself afterwards for oh. not thinking to check, but I ate them. What sort of crisps were they? Um, like, sort of corn, like, shapey corn crisps things, I don't know, like... Because Mappy served them, like, in a bowl already, oh. so I'm just like, oh, yeah, I'm nom nom, and then afterwards I was like, ah, oh, shit. What flavour were they? Um, they were, like, cheesy. Ah, uh, yeah, that's... Should have yeah. thought. Mm. I didn't actually know what flavour they were when they were, I just dove in I was like oh, these sure, are sure. nice but yeah they, but actually it wasn't that they had cheese in them they had milk in them I would I'm salt and sure, vinegar crisps quite often have milk in them why why I if I was I'm not a vegan but if I was going to break my veganism I'd rather just go fuck it I'm having one steak and then back on the vegan I think I don't think I would because I think unfortunately because actually like I although I, I have very very um, <clears throat> vivid memories of how nice tasting certain foods were but I can't unsee the stuff that I now associate them with. So actually, although I remember like, oh, like a cheese board. Ah, oh, how lush that is. But then I think about like, yeah, but it's cow breast milk that's been like set. That's kind of gross. Like, I, I can't, I think it's good mm. though, because it means I don't think I'm going to go backwards and I don't think I'll slip. Because no matter how tempted I am by the memory of how nice something is, I am still kind of grossed out by what it actually is. So Terrible. like with a steak or something, like... Like, I'm still like, yeah, like, or when you've got belly pork, like, the smell is incredible, and I remember how nice that crackling used to be, but then I actually think about, oh, well, I could just, because I think if I actually said to you, can I have a bit, you'd let me, um, you'd be, you'd be surprised, but you'd mm. let me, but I don't, like, when I actually then take the leap to then imagine picking it up and putting it in my mouth and eating it, I'm like, mm, no, so, I don't know dead if, flesh. I don't know if I would want to let you. Why? Because, well, I... You know, not in like a kind of, no, I'm not sharing kind of way, but like, 
if I if you just said it, I I really want to be like, are you sure? Is this what you yeah. want? Because if you then the next morning regret it, yeah, no, like, I think I that's fair. Like I, just... I don't think you'd tell like tell me no, but you'd be like, well, really, are you, are you sure? But I, mm. you wouldn't sort of. If I tomorrow decided I wasn't going to be vegan anymore, you wouldn't be upset with me. But especially um, if you'd had like a couple of drinks or something, yeah. I'd be like, no, oh, you think like you want this now, but tomorrow, tomorrow you, might, you might be yeah. like, like, look, if you don't have this now. But tomorrow, you're still feeling like you want to have some pork belly. I'll buy some more pork belly. And I'll cook it, especially I'll for you. It. Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll yeah, do the whole I, thing if that's what you want. I'm not going to do that, though. But, <clears> yeah, no, I think if you... Yeah, I think... my approach to... Yeah, I think that would be fair. Because, um, yeah, you're not one to sort of tell me what I can and can't do, but I think you'd be, you'd be right, because it would be so out of character for me to be thinking that, mm. uh, that it would be a bit like, oh, are you all right? Um, but yeah, I don't think I'll go, because I've been, I, it's probably, it, I can't, I didn't actually have like a set date. I was gradually like weaning off things. So I don't actually know what the last day I ever, because actually I gave up dairy before I gave up fish. Mm. Um, so I think the very last thing I ever had was probably fish that was non-vegan, but I don't know what date it was. Uh, it was in 2017 at some point, so I'm uh, into sort of that sort of region of how, like three and a half years ish, um, but I don't know quite uh, quite when. Um, but yeah, I think it's been long enough that I've got used to not. Um, so I don't. Yeah, I think like it's good because although like sometimes it's a bore, like and you see people eating things that are nice, or like you go out to a restaurant and like. Like the the pub we went to when we were down in Dorset, the one day we went there and looked at the menu and there were three vegan options and none of them were that inspiring. But I was like, three, that's that's pretty good going, actually, because usually you're lucky if you've got one. There'll be like the vegetarian and vegan section will be vegetarian. There'll be one vegan option. But actually, there were three that were vegan. But then we went back a couple of days later to actually eat there. And the only one that was left on the menu was a butternut squash and a sweet potato curry. And it was very underwhelming. Um, and it was just like, mm, yeah, this tastes like sort of lots of ingredients you've popped in a pot together, but there's no real thought as to sort of any depth of flavor or sort of anything used to make it creamy or, or like, it's basically like, yes, the, the, th the prerequisite for this meal is it is vegan, mm. not it is tasty. <laughs> um, but you know, like it's fine. Generally speaking at home, it's not an issue and out and about it isn't usually an issue. It's just becomes tricky when you're sort of slightly in less control over what the options you've got so in restaurants limited. or uh, other people's sort of occasions like weddings or something or um special events where you kind of have to like, <coughs> state your dietary requirements and you know you're going to be brought out so because also i'm actually quite a fussy eater about certain things like and vegan options are always mushroom based and i don't really like mushrooms well my previous long-term girlfriend um was vegetarian as you know and um and you're vegan now and so I, as like an omnivore, but who nonetheless has to eat with mm. a vegan or a vegetarian, and so has to kind of choose sort of restaurants and, and places to eat out accordingly, mm. uh, I have noticed a shift mm. in, you know, in, in the right direction in the last oh, yeah, kind of decade sure. and things. But nonetheless, it's... Yeah, pretty... well, actually, I'm pretty, ha like, I, I'm hugely impressed at anybody who managed to be vegan, like, in the 70s and 80s, and there were some, but, like, it's it, it would have been really difficult then. That would have been lots of very plain, very bland... And I, I think that there's still a perception that kind of hangs over the, the People decided. think it's vegan food is going to be but... health food, and very much no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't this, eat vegan health it. food. I Look at me. People, Either people go, oh, it's all going to be health food, and it's going to be horrible. It's all going to be lentils and dals and, mm. and falafel, and, and it's going to be miserable. Mm. Or you get the, the flip side of that is people going, brilliant, I'm going to go vegan. I'm going to lose so much weight. It's going to be super healthy. And it's like, no, Not you can necessarily. Have so many yeah. carbs. So many carbs, so much all fat. All the deep fried chips. <laughs> like yeah, it's, yeah. Um... It doesn't like. Um, there's a thing that uh, I've sort of seen doing the rounds because there's there's very much two sort of tight factions in the vegan community, mm. and they're largely people who are vegan for uh, animal welfare and e environmental purposes, and there are people who are vegan for health purposes. Usually, those people refer to themselves as t as eating a plant based diet instead because uh, while they might eat plant-based, they also tend not to eat processed and tend to avoid sugars, and it tends mm. to be more of a health kick, but it is away from dairies and meats. Whereas vegans, like myself, 
very much vegan for the animals here, people. This is nothing to do with my health. Um, I mean, we eat all sorts actually, of processed stuff. Don't oh we? god, yeah, and like, like some of my favourite vegan <clears throat> meals do involve like quite heavily processed sort of. Uh, protein alternatives and things like so it's 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 a world of difference but you can eat really good really tasty vegan food for sure um i still really enjoy my food actually i have noticed and it's hard to sort of say i can't sort of say for sure definitely a vegan diet absolutely helped but i can say that since going vegan my health has been the best it's been since i was first diagnosed but i had made other lifestyle changes around the same time because it was the first time i was working for myself and i think that helps with my mental health which then probably helps you be more active which then helps with the fibro and lots of things so i'm not going to go vegan will being vegan will cure your fibromyalgia i'm not going to say that but i will say it really helped mine um it's certainly added into sort of uh, being helpful i think avoiding sort of um things like sort of too much dairy i think is, is a pretty good idea for most people anyway i think people tend to eat too much because it is it's very fatty but it's also it's it's rich in animal fats and it's sort of quite bad for your cholesterol and it's, they're not like very healthy fats to be eating a lot of um but that being said uh like you know i used to eat loads of cheese i get it it's really tasty they actually sort of say it, it is equivalent like it's almost as addictive as genuinely like controlled substances well here's the thing right if i buy like a thing of brie now oh i have to i have to eat that whole thing don't i yep because you won't share it with me poor you but like that's <laughs> terrible for my waistline would you have shared it with uh like you just don't buy it then if you're worried about your waistline no but i still want some brie yeah um you can buy the little stupid little ones that you could put in like pack lunches the ones that are, like individual triangles yeah. they're quite good but they're not necessarily the most cost, cost effective though, no they? and yeah. also the they like I, I used to remember sort of with brie actually getting a big chunk of brie is better because then you get enough of the melty middle bit mm. And not quite so much of the rind, whereas with the small triangles, you're getting quite a high rind to middle bit ratio. Because what I want to do, I want to do that thing where you like get a whole wheel of brie mm. and then you slice up garlic and like push that down into mm. it. And then you put twi sprigs of rosemary in it as well. Mm -hmm. And then you bake that all in the oven. And I thought that was more traditionally camembert that you'd do that with. Maybe you would do that with camembert. Mm. I've had camembert I that way. And then just to... ripping up fresh bread and dipping it yes. on. Yes. Yeah. Uh, willing to kind of go camembert if that is what people do i'm okay with that but uh but certainly people do bake a brie as well mm. don't they? i think i gave my parents like a, a cheese baking dish once for christmas um i tell you what i've been wasn't even on my list to talk about any of that well i'll tell you what else i've been doing today ellie what <laughs> it's always weird when you use my name um <laughs> so like, sorry because i'll like, tell you chris I'll, I'll explain i'll explain to you why that's weird because normally just uh, between the two of us i, I call her keith <laughs> so it is weird when I say Ellie. I, I know that you uh, know her as Ellie. That's why I use her name. But she finds it very strange because she's used to Keith now. But um, tell you what I've been doing today, Keith. I've been reading problematic comic oh, does books. Does it have to be Keith? Uh, um, problem. Oh yes, you did tell me about your problematic comic know. books. And actually, I have some thoughts on this. But yeah, do explain why well, it, they're problematic because. It, well, I have some thoughts as well. So it'll be interesting. Mm. We can exchange some thoughts because. Uh, I didn't set out, I didn't go, oh, I'll, I'll read something problematic. <laughs> I read something that I thought was going to be very innocent. Yeah. Um, I, basically, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's original Fantastic Four comics from the 1960s right. that were essentially kind of children's comics that then gained kind of a bit of traction and readership amongst teenagers yeah, and eventually sure. adults. But, like, they're, um, you know, they're supposed to be kind of suitable for all ages. So you don't, you don't think there's going to be anything... Imagine they're going to be whatever. quite appropriate you th for you kids. Think, and... Yeah, you think like, oh, maybe I'll, if I ever have kids, I'll give this to them to read, you know, and, and the original they can discover all these sort of superheroes for themselves for the first time. Because and... some of the comic books I've got, the superhero comics, are really great, but you're like, well, I wouldn't give give this to kids because they deal it's in some quite adult themes, yeah. a bit heavy, or you know, some swearing or whatever. But you know, original 1960s Fantastic Four, you go, brilliant, I can give that to my kids. And I know it's not going to be too violent or sweary or whatever. Right. And I can just enjoy the kind of adventures and the soap opera of it. Yeah. Um, but then I'm reading these and there's a bit where Johnny Storm, the human torch, he's gone off on his own for a walk and he spots an attractive woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, he tries to approach her, but she like creates a distraction and disappears. Right. So he's, he's missed out on meeting her. But, and he's a bit gutted because she's uh, very pretty and everything. But... Uh, he wants to meet her, so he does what anyone would do 
under the circumstances. He goes back the next day to the same location and hides in the hope that she comes back uh, and he waits there for an hour for her to appear. Now when she he does appear, he then tries to approach her again. He says, you're so pretty, you know, everyone should get to see you or something like that, words to that effect. And then, and then he pursues her even after she asks him to leave her alone and says, mm-hmm. please, um... Mm, and he I've got to, thoughts. Eventually, he wins her trust by lying to her. Um, what does he lie to her about? So she's an inhuman. What's that? <laughs> I know it's a whole thing. All right. So, well, she's an inhuman. Mm. Um, which are people? Oh, I can't. I, I don't even know. Uh, okay, don't <laughs> explain the inhumans so, bit. But he isn't. In, it's a bit like the mutants in right. X Men, but right. different. Okay. So imagine she was an X Men. Yeah, imagine it's X-Men. For the sake of argument, she's an X-Man, she's right. a mutant, right. and uh, he and she's got superpowers because of this. Hmm. He reveals himself to have uh, superpowers. Right. Now, because he's got superpowers, hmm. she goes, oh, you've got superpowers. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't realise you were one of us. Right. And he goes, oh, yeah. I'm I'm one of you. Um, oh, but he's no, he, not. He's not. Right. He's a superhero. He's he's got powers, got for, different powers for different reasons. Right, okay. And so, but he's like thinking, oh well, I'll go along with this and see where it goes. And so he's essentially lying to her to gain her trust. Yeah. Um, which is not great. Counterproductive that. No. Um, yeah. No. So this actually <clears throat> like. Obviously, like that, in it, you're sort of thinking in and of itself. Oh well, we've seen that sort of story a million times. It's harmless, but actually, because we've seen that type of story mm. so many times, that's why it's not harmless. I find that really ugh, gives me the heebie-jeebies because what that does, and I've seen it for myself with men I have encountered, with men my friends have encountered, um, so, most of which actually, I think are coming not from a, like, creepy, dominating place, but are coming from a I'm-trying-to-be-romantic place, but have a tendency to make grand gestures and sort of... Or pursue the girl. Pursue you even if you've sort of backed off and... An I'm example like, no, I will I give... To, I have to win her over. I have to win her over. I have to prove to her how much I care. But what usually that means is by... The way in which I, they prove to you how much they care is by ignoring your boundaries. So a good example of this, which I, I I could name basically, I think every woman, either this has happened to them or it's happened to one of their girls, but um, having broken up with somebody or having like in a, in a relationship and had just had a fight or whatever, mm. uh, but you don't mm. live together and them sort of sending messages or phone calls being like, please let me come over, I want to talk this through, let me come over and go, no, I don't want to see you. And then what happens? They turn up with the flowers at the front door. And like every single film, TV program and children's story has been telling men to do that, to prove to women that they care. We don't want you to do that. We live alone. You turning up at our house on when we're on our own and you're unwanted is very much creepy, not romantic. Because essentially it's saying, you say no, I say I'm doing it anyway. I encroach on your space despite your protestations, which suggests that my grand gesture is more, more important than your boundaries. Oh. And I don't actually hold it against guys for thinking that way because it is essentially what they've been told to do from childhood so yeah it's problematic and we need to change the narrative because we need to sort of have uh, yeah it might be less of a romantic story but boy meets girl boy likes girl boy asks girl out she says no they have a beautiful friendship and they live happily ever after as platonic friends like that's fine isn't it it's like also, because it leads to the kind of, um, the pursuit and the I'll just keep trying, I'll just keep hitting on her and I'll just keep sort of displaying my interest um, and eventually she'll cave, which, ugh. But essentially what happens is um, guy hits on you, guy hits on you, guy hits on you and literally saying things like I am not interested, this is never going to happen, I don't see you that way I'm sorry, can we just be friends this is not happening, doesn't work 
and then unfortunately the really creepy and really unfortunate thing that does work the only thing that often does work is saying that you have a boyfriend because then suddenly this man's respect for imaginary man he's never met kicks into gear and then he leaves you the fuck alone it's like <clears throat> why is my word that i don't want to fuck you not as valuable as somebody else is already fucking me, so it would be disrespectful to him to keep pursuing me. To be clear, though, I'm not an imaginary man. Um, <laughs> I don't mean you, but I like... Just, I just want to gaslight anyone. <laughs> <laughs> like... But it's really, really damaging, and it's it's led to... Because I've, I've mentioned on here, and I, like obviously we're making light of this, but I've had a few fairly nightmarish stories, one of which was very much centred around a man who was doing this sort of, like, really just not accepting no for an answer. And so trying different tactics and being pretty relentless. And it made me so uncomfortable. Mm. And it's just like, literally, like, me saying no is not enough for you to stop trying. And that's really dangerous territory and we should not be normalizing that no means no it doesn't mean try harder no like and i shouldn't like we're all adults i shouldn't have to <coughs> tell you that but because and i don't blame actually like because actually I, I do think quite like obviously there are some creepy predatory guys who use these tactics to their advantage and know full well what they're doing but i don't think the vast majority of blokes that sort of accidentally creep someone out realize they're doing it they think they're being romantic and i don't really hold that against them I, like it's a misjudged grand gesture but the best grand gesture you can make is respecting somebody's boundaries and sort of like if you really want to see them and they don't want to see you the best thing you can do is respect that and say okay well when you are ready i really do want to talk this through with you uh, my door is always open let me know and like maybe let some time pass and then say hello and see how they're doing you don't have to show up outside the house. That's creepy. And actually, it has got threatening undertones. It really does. Because then it's like, I know where you live. And I can come here whenever I want. And it feels creepy. Does not feel romantic. Even if it's like someone you're in a relationship with. It's still, I said no. And yeah. you showed up anyway. People, like it's, Even in relationships, you need boundaries. Yeah. Like... It, very much in relationships you need boundaries because you can still say no when you're in a sort of consensual sexual relationship with someone that doesn't mean that they are owed you when they want you and vice versa obviously mm. and you still have to give people space if they need it and yeah and um, yeah i think I there's a lot of really the word space. um yeah there's just sort of really toxic ideas of what is romantic that have sort of it they've pervaded into every mm. crack and corner of popular culture and like i don't want to be someone who's going oh you can't even say this anymore because it's like well sometimes it's harmless but sometimes the sort of message that you are sending oh. is essentially oh, that's a little bit like that isn't a message i would want to be telling my sons I, my sons i would not want to raise thinking that that's what they have to do to get attention and that's what they have to do to sort of show their affection. And also, I don't want to be raising my daughters to think that that's normal. And also, because actually some women get fall, fall into the cracks of playing the sort of almost testing them like oh well if he cared he'd try harder like don't do that you're ruining it for the rest of us stop it uh respect yourself uh, respect your own boundaries if you say no to someone and you're really hoping they're then gonna go oh but she doesn't mean it and then they make a grand gesture then you are being a dick to the rest of us because you're making lots of other creepy men make grand gestures that we don't want basically say what you want if say what you don't want and then if the other person does the opposite they're being a dick but don't say you want something so that they like don't say no so that they do it again that's really bad don't do that not with not with platonic relationships not with romantic relationships not with work relationships just say what you actually think now, <laughs> just, please it's so much easier i can't speak for keith here <laughs> but uh i'm not what i'm not saying is i'm not saying i want the fantastic four to be cancelled <laughs> i'm not saying even these run of issues. I'm not saying they shouldn't exist or they need to be taken out of publication. Uh, what I am saying is that they need to be read like um, with context and the understanding that they're a product of their time, yeah. with the maturity to kind of approach the material with that perspective. Yeah. 
and I'm saying I wouldn't give them to my kids to look at if I had kids. Uh, I'm sure there's probably people out there. Uh, well, I don't know. I think most people who watch this are good eggs, but I think potentially people could see this video and maybe either think that we're a pair of snowflakes or feel a bit defensive because something they have fond nostalgic feelings yeah. for, something they love, they feel is being attacked. Um, and no, they might, no, I'm and not they, saying no, that at no, all. No, yeah, and, we, and they might think like, well. I, I read all those books and it never did me any harm. And I, and what I would say to that is, didn't it though? <laughs> no, because I'm you not don't necessarily saying, know. Because yeah, it's it's, it's I'm not subtle saying and it's like oh, people who read the Fantastic Four are going to turn into like abusers. But I am saying that the uh, portrayals of of people and relationships and things in the media that we consume when we're young and kind of malleable and kind of learning about the world around us all the time. Uh, does uh, shape how we think about things yeah. and and make us internalize ideas about gender roles that yeah. aren't always Absolutely. true or useful or helpful, and you know often you don't even know it you know don't know it's happened or the or where these opinions that you have have, have kind of come from, um, and you can end up like you know enforcing those in your life in much milder ways than actual abuse or having to kind of be aware of it and try and fight against it and mm. just constantly yeah and it's i'm sure it's true of us as well in lots of ways we're not saying we're above it no um, but that's and and, when, and that's exactly why we don't want uh, our kids to see it because our kids are just like us are going to be normal people we're not better than anyone else we're not uh immune to this so we don't want to expose yeah. our kids to the just kind of have materials, those you know? conversations <clears throat> and sort of um because yeah and actually one thing that i think sort of uh, the world has moved on and is better now i think at trying to um give more positive female roles to little girls and that's great but we should be doing it for boys as well and also showing boys that femininity is perfectly okay emotions are okay like liking dance is okay wanting to play with dolls is okay all of that stuff the idea that toys should be gendered is kind of bonkers really um but it seems more socially acceptable for a girl to be a tomboy than for a boy to be sort of feminine um and that's shit because it's essentially what's actually happening there is it's saying in some ways it is better to be masculine than feminine so there's there's an inherent like oh well a girl wanting to be like men that's understandable because we're brilliant uh but uh, a boy wanting to be like girls ugh. like it's so so fucking stupid and have we not moved on like we, it's not like we're living in the dark ages where male roles are sort of hunter-gatherer type things where you need to be big and butch and strong and go and kill the fucking ox and bring it back and cook it. Like, this is not the world we're living in. We should be basically making humans grow up to be imaginative and creative and sort of work in the world that we live in. And most of what... That's why women actually sort of, sort of tend to sort of excel when they're allowed to is because tend to have a, a, a bit of a broader skill set because we're allowed to use all of ours whereas you're sort of told oh no you can't do that you can't go into that you're sort of suppressed from doing things that are seen as masculine but we can have the whole gender the whole spectrum is fine it's because it, i think like ultimately yeah like it used to be illegal for a woman to wear trousers for example but now i could wear whatever the fuck i want well, that's a weird i one, can that, wear Literally, I could wear hyper-masculine clothes and nobody would bat an eyelid. However, a man wearing feminine clothes, that suddenly is still taboo. And it's just like, it's just a fucking skirt, mate. Let's not lose our shit. Well, it's like... Um... <coughs> that is, I think, a delivery. So excuse me, we're just going to pause. It was, it was an Amazon delivery. Sorry about that, but we are back in the room. But we are going to sort of wrap up. But, um, um, yeah, it was just like, it's a bit like that Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue. They yeah. literally give him a, a girl's name to make him, because they know that I'll make That'll him get That'll make him tough. And he'll become tough, because he'll have to fight them, no girls. But it is a, a weird thing, isn't it? That thing of, because, you know, things were so uh, unequal for, for women for so long. Um, it's there's... still got the inherent undertone that somehow women are worse and it, and it is still unequal uh, for women in lots of ways um, but what it has meant because of there's been a 
feminism and things, there has been that push for kind of, no, women can do anything and wear what they want and do what they want. And there hasn't really been... Well, this is what the new wave of mm. feminism <clears throat> is and should be focused on is um it is obviously it's all about equality mm. but people sort of assume mainly they hear the words feminism but because fem is in it they assume it's about making things better for women it's not anymore it previously that was the main aim because it was well we want the vote and we want to have it like reproductive necessary. yeah we want to have reproductive rights we want to be able to leave our husbands if we want to without becoming destitute and that sort of thing so previously mm. yes it was mainly about bringing women up to the same level of sort of social status as men. But what has fallen by the wayside, therefore, are sort of things that actually are much worse for men than they are for women. Mental health is the main one uh, that springs to mind. Like because of all these like really, really damaging sort of stereotypes about men don't cry, man up, all of that bullshit that basically men that are struggling uh, with emotional or, or mental health issues really feel they can't talk about it which is why the male suicide rate is so much higher than the female suicide rate which is a fucking travesty the suicide rate in general is way too high but the fact that there's such a disparate uh, dis discrepancy between uh, female and male rate shows that men are struggling and not able to seek help because they feel like that suggests weakness also, you've got like some bullshit sort of discrepancies in um, childcare issues and custody cases that the assumption is that the mother will be a better parent than the father. And that's not going to necessarily be the case. Of course, it's not. Um, and just the, the general assumption, um, like sort of I know of a couple that um, the, the woman earns significantly more than the guy. She earns big bucks uh, and they had a baby. Uh, and you can sh you can share the parental leave now, which is brilliant. So she went back to work after sort of taking a little bit of time off to recover after birth. And then the fella was the principal caregiver. And people give him, oh, really? You're, you're the principal? Why? Why is that then? And it's just like, because I'm a father and it made sense. <laughs> like that, that should be enough. And nobody would bat an eyelid if the woman mm. doesn't go back to work, but the bloke doesn't. And suddenly, suddenly it's like, oh, he's, that's weird. And it's like, no, it's not. Grow up. Uh, so, yeah, so basically, grow up <laughs> is, is my, my point of view on that. Um, we're all, like, we're all, we can all look after each other. And I think gender roles coming into sort of whether or not you can be emotional or creative or imaginative bullshit. Um, and, yeah, what I can wear is up to me. Uh, what you can wear is up to you. And anybody and else who's got fucking issues with that can uh, have a little word with themselves. And neither of us make a lot of money, so we're both going to stay home and be primary caregiver. Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Get me pregnant. Right, off we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that was aimed directly at me, that instruction to <laughs> I, you, the I, viewer. I, I was telling you. I was oh. like, no, I'm telling you. Um, but anyway, so that we're on All that right. on that bombshell. Um, follow our instructions. Come on. <laughs> Right, so uh, in the interim, uh, like and subscribe. There's, There's no, no shame, shame in it. it.